the actual data that are presented are largely summaries of other things. This is the the the, um, the primary reference that I have is a is a review of a whole bunch of studies. So I'm not showing a whole lot of data. There will be a little bit, but most of mostly it's summaries, and it's the the whole topic is related to um, the function of cannabinoid receptors. The reason that I focused on this thing was twofold. One was uh, because of the seminar we had uh, uh, last week about uh, you know medicinal uh, THC or however they present it to patients, um, which obviously is a pretty pretty much an emerging new new uh, uh, legitimacy wise an emerging new drug, um, and that's a that's a very interesting thing in itself, but there. There's been research going on about the pharmacological effect, as obviously the physiological effect has been researched um, uh, by, by people over decades or centuries. But uh, in terms of pharmacology and other formal studies, there have been a lot of work done in the last few decades. Um, the other thing that triggered me besides that presentation was I found a paper that came out just a few days ago that indicated that um, the... Um, particular receptors in the brain that uh, THC and other uh, cannabinoids interact with, they're actually two different receptors, <clears throat> that, that these receptors, uh, that the uh, stimulation of the receptors by endocannabinoids, that is THC-like substances that are found in our bodies that are generated as a result of a variety of physiological effects, um, can reduce a variety of sort of symptoms or downstream effects of Alzheimer's disease. And that, that's a pretty, um, it, it's, a, it's a pretty amazing effect in a way because the, the, I think the main, it, it's, it's difficult to say what the main issue is, is with Alzheimer's disease, but the, one of the outcomes on a, on a physiological effect is the generation of, of these plaques in the brain that are called A-beta plaque, and that's basically to identify the protein but there are these things where the, the, the normal tissue in the brain turns into this thing that can't function the way a brain is supposed to function. So finding these in the brain, aside from you know the, the memory effects and other things one would see outwardly, finding these in the brain are diagnostic for Alzheimer's. And it appears that there are, there, there are some mechanisms within this entire so-called endocannabinoid system which is the thing that that the you know active ingredient in marijuana tickles, but also these endocannabinoids that are made synthetically and tested in laboratories also can interact. <coughs> that by doing so, one can change the um, the physiology and the biochemistry that results in putting down these these Alzheimer plaques. So there might be a way actually to influence Alzheimer's disease as a result of doing this. And this is, you know. Another couple of years that I think will be a lot further down the road on it. So that's <clears throat> that's what gets me to the topic, and I think I better start this thing. I'm guessing this arrow to the right is the uh, trigger. So the topic today is to discuss whether there is a natural role that is. Um, something that is just built into our bodies for uh, cannabinoid receptors. Um, the cannabinoid that is that one typically finds that people know about, uh, THC, tetrahydrocannabinol, uh, is the primary uh, thing that's found in, in marijuana and similar type of, of uh, drugs that now are being used for treatment of pain. Uh, obviously, the treatment of pain uh, by... Uh, THC or any other drug has pharmacology that has a direct effect on uh, on the entire pain system, whether it's pain transmission or synthesis of something or whatever it happens to be. But to be able to uh, block that effect by something um, that is derived from a natural compound is one of the major trends, actually, in pharmacology. A lot of drugs have been discovered in, in which somebody accidentally finds just through folk medicine that something works. And then some person with a laboratory says, oh, gee, how has it happened that this works? What the mechanism is that underlies this whole thing? 
And is there a way that we can uh, improve it? Is there a way I can start a company and make billions of dollars with it? There are a lot of, you know, my uh, mother-in-law died because of this, so I really care a lot about it. There are a lot of motivators to this entire uh, institution, if you will, of uh, drug development and discovery. And in this particular case, um, there are a lot of motivators because anytime you say cannabinoid, lots of people say, oh, gee, I think I know what that means. Um, when you say Alzheimer's disease, even more people will say, gee, I think I know what that means. You put the two of them together and it has a good chance of having an impact. And if I was a university faculty person, I would think I could probably get grants for this. So it's, it's a practical thing to look at. So, do I do this? Oh. Ah, is that number one? Okay, so uh, the first question is, what are cannabinoid receptors? Uh, the cabinet, they, they basically have uh, uh, two families of these things. Um, the first one, they're called CB for uh, cannabinoid binding. Uh, cannabinoid means anything that has a structure similar to tetrahydrocannabinol that's found in THC. So as a family, anything would be labeled that, whether it's found in the plant or whether it's, you know, synthesized or whatever. Um, so generally speaking, there are two groups of receptors, um, and they are different gene products and so forth, and they've been studied pretty well. Uh, the first, the CB1 group, are expressed in most regions of the adult brain. Um, it's found both, if you think about the synapse, which is where you know, it's, uh, nerve signals are transmitted from one nerve to another or from a nerve to a muscle, for example, or to other things that can receive the, the signal besides muscles. But the, the synapse is that gap in between. And um, the receptor can be found on both sides of the synapse, in, depending on the situation. Um, it's frequently found in situations where, as a result of some um, um, neurological signal, you can, you can imagine there being a high reward, uh, that there is an addictive function, or there's a cognitive function. And all of those things kind of work together, as you can imagine. So um, it's, it's uh, popularly found in the amygdala, cingulate con uh, cortex, and prefrontal cortex. Um, Receptor CB2 is expressed mainly by immune cells. Now, this is kind of a vague set to say mainly. Uh, this is a, a still an emerging field, and nobody's really quite figured out exactly hierarchically what came first and what's more important or anything like that. But CB2 is also found in neurons and other uh, brain cells, um, brain endothelial cells, um, and it's also both pre- and postsynaptic. So... Ah, so what do these uh, what do these guys do? Um, these receptors have a multiplicity of ligands. A, a ligand is the thing that binds to a receptor. That's just sort of the the kind of language that's used. So um, the ligand is a small molecule. THC is a small molecule. Uh, these other things are small molecules, meaning that compared to a protein, which might be you know, as wide across as you can stretch your arms, this would be something of the size of a finger or two, relatively speaking. So there are many ligands that can bind to these cannabinoid receptors. Uh, they're not necessarily grouped into uh, one and two. That is, some ligands will bind to both of these things. Um, the, the ligand is the thing that triggers a response. That is, the, the receptor itself is, is kind of like um, a, a lock on a door. And, it, and the ligand itself is the key. Uh, the, the key can be, um, one, one term that they use for this, which is obviously taken from other, other, uh, other areas, is that it's promiscuous, meaning that you can have a lot of different shapes, but generally speaking, there's like a commonality among the shapes of the chemicals that will fit into that key. So you can have a number of ligands that are chemicals related to one another in some fashion that bind to that one spot, result, resulting in the receptor doing whatever it does. And each of these things, because they're structurally a little bit different, they are different chemicals, so they're structurally different, um, can have different results on what that receptor does. It can change 
uh, the, the way the receptor changes shape, the receptor might stick to something else. The receptor might stimulate some enzyme to produce something. There's a lot of kind of downstream effects that can happen as a result of the ligand binding to the receptor. So for example, CB1 has uh, been shown to increase calcium levels, uh, inhibit cyclic AMP, which is one of the uh, first um, um, uh, sort of signal molecules to be discovered in, in, in animal physiology. And generally speaking, CB1 uh, provides fine-tuning of synaptic activity. Um, the other one, the other major class, CB2, uh, activates uh, a lot of immune cells. Um, and again, to back up a little bit, as I mentioned before, the total uh, list of functions and actions of these two different classes of receptors have not been fully uh, um, described. Uh, most of what's been done has been <coughs> done in animal models because obviously you can't just be doing things with humans right off the bat. So CB2 activates virtually all different kinds of immune cells. Um, and as a result, it can reduce the production of inflammatory cytokines, moderate the immune response in a variety of organs, uh, control the activation and migration of immune cells, which is you know, how your white blood cells get to some place and you, know, you have infection there and it gets pus and all that. Uh, so it can control that uh, activity and also uh, regulate inflammatory and pain responses. So this little cartoon kind of, I, I tried to minimize this because when you start getting into, into this field, you wind up with um, pictures like this that have a lot going on and it's all abbreviated. And you kind of need to spend a few months studying it all to be able to even explain it, let alone understand it on the other end. So I tried to minimize that to, to only one slide. Um, so basically, um, this slide kind of illustrates um, that there are two different kinds of um, terminals that uh, can result in, at least within one model system, can result in the production of chemicals that are having downstream effects. Uh, I mentioned cyclic AM AMP before. It was one of the first of these chemicals that was first that was discovered, um, and uh, these are typically called secondary messengers. You have an initial thing that happens biochemically. Downstream of that, you have the production of cyclic AMP. Um, cyclic AMP will go out and and impact some other biochemical event that goes on. So it's a, it's a secondary messenger to the initial thing that happens. These uh, secondary messengers that they're talking about here um, are um, these green and little blue dots that you see floating about. Um, there are two primary classes of them. Uh, the one is called 2AG, and the other one is called AEA. And we could just leave it at that because we don't need to go any further into them. It's just good to know that there's more than one of these things. And as with most of um, pharmacology and biochemistry in general, once you get started, you find a cascade of things. Because nothing is ever really simple. There's no simplicity in any of this stuff. Not in the house. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And roof and back in the it's, it, it, it really, it's, it's, um, it's amazing. multiplier effects all over the place. OK. So um, why do we care about endocannabinoids? Obviously, the, uh, the, the, the most popular of these things, the, which is uh, tetrahydrocannabinol, is in, involved, as it turns out, in brain reward circuits. Uh, it turns out that a lot of these other ones that are, that are synthesized in laboratories can also interact with brain reward circuits along with other things. Um, so, And again, we're going to skip all the biochemistry because it would be a waste of time here. But basically, it influences natural reward systems related to food, sex, social interaction. Those are big categories. And anything you can imagine in there probably fits within what, tetra, uh, what these uh, endocannabinoids will interact with. Um, and all of these are mediated through the mesolimbic dopamine response along with the endogenous opioid system. Um, and there are endogenous opioids, which is why Opioids have a physiological effect. Um, these things aren't just by chance. It just didn't happen 
that heroin and opium have effects on our bodies because they come from a plant. It happens because we generate something inside of ourselves that has a similar structure to that. And somewhere along the way, the plant came about to do this. So, um, yeah, endocannabinoids are involved in reward circuits, and they're very important. But these, you know, a lot of these reward circuits are neurological, um, which has a lot to do with Alzheimer's disease. Um, the endocannabinoid system has uh, a lot of overlap in, in the physiology of Alzheimer's disease. Um, and there are very high levels of these receptors that I mentioned before, CB1 and CB2, are found in post-mortem Alzheimer's disease brains. If you just take a person and you, you know, send them off to, to the lab and they make slides and all that kind of thing, you're going to find a lot of these things. You can also find it by, by PET imaging in living patients. So you, you can do the immunohistochemistry in a lab, you can do it with live patients, and you, you find these things there. Um, so um, just to give you some examples of what's been found uh, based on the pharmacology, uh, and these are all model systems because you, know, you can't just do this with humans, but, uh, but you can do it with, uh, with, with uh, human cells in certain ways, but not much has been done with that to some extent. Um, but as we see in this list, um, microglial cell culture um, is one model system that's been used. And um, the, uh, the effect that's mediated on these receptors, these endocannabinoid receptors, is to reduce um, inflammatory mediators, uh, nitrogen oxide and uh, TNF-alpha. Um, and, it, and as a result, it increased uh, phagocytosis of, uh, of the Alzheimer's protein, uh, A-beta, which, which was really the target of this paper that came out just a couple of days ago that, I, that was what drove me to doing this thing. Um, there is, it turns out, a fair amount of evidence that the endocannabinoid system interacts with Alzheimer's disease in some fashion. Nobody's quite figured it out yet. So this, what I'm providing in these tables is just kind of a list of some of the evidence that's, that was accumulated um, before this other paper came out. <clears throat> so in, for example, in an in a Alzheimer's uh, model system using rat glioma cells, um, the uh, these receptor system, um, the cannab endocannabinoid receptor system, uh, the effect was to phosphorylate tau, which is one of the proteins that's, that's increased in, in blood and also in Alzheimer's plaques as a result of Alzheimer's disease. Um, and it also increases the number of, of, uh, of circulating astrocytes. In a human macrophage cell culture, um, it stimulates the removal of, of uh, A-beta plaque. A-beta, a again, is the material that's kind of left behind as a signature of, of Alzheimer's disease in the brain. So if you're stimulating macrophages to remove the, black, the plaque, that suggests that there may be some, you know, this is kind of fanciful, but there may be some way to modify the system so that one can, you know, in, encourage, if you will, the macrophages in, in elderly people to, um, more rapidly dispose of plaque that forms in the brain. And this may be decades off, who knows. Um, also in microglial cell culture, it stimulates uh, the migration and it's the activity of these cells. You know, they, if they just sit there, they're not interested in anything, they're, they're pretty useless, but they, they migrate to a site. The reason that they migrate is because they're sensing something and that it gets them excited and they say, oh, we better go take care of things. Um, in another model system, uh, a rat model system, um, these, uh, the mediated effect through these receptors would Im could improve cognitive performance. And you might ask yourself, how do you test for cognitive performance with a rat? And I suppose you know you could go to the pet store and probably figure out a nice way to do that on your own. But um, I'm sure here they ran them through a maze or some other kind of thing where you could come up with a quantitative measure. Um, but and these were um, these were not Alzheimer's disease model rats. These were just you know just kind of store bought rats that you could get any place or probably probably find one in a barn someplace. Um, it would also increase the brain uptake of glucose, 
which is it, kind of an indicator of uh, mental activity, of brain stimulation. And we do see um, microglial response of A beta. So um, another study, again with a rat, um, again reduced microglia and also reduced interleukin-1 beta. Um, and a human endothelial cell, which is it's a nice model because of they're human cells, but because it's a cell culture, you don't have to you know, go to institutional review boards and endanger patients and all that kind of thing. Um, and usually, you, I don't know if these were primary cells or if it was a cell line, but if it's a cell line, you can just buy them and work with them. And, you know, it, it's, it's a whole lot easier to get some, some uh, relevant data. But it increased the transport of the A-beta protein across the blood-brain barrier, which is really very interesting because, you know, the, the blood-brain barrier obviously is kind of like a sieve, right? It's, 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 goes, it's in between, um, it, it separates the circulatory system of the brain from general circulation. So, uh, but when people have Alzheimer's disease, that blood-brain barrier breaks down. Um, when people have uh, glioblastoma, the blood-brain barrier breaks down. There are, there are a number of things that can cause that kind of sieve to open up a bit. Um, so anyway, so to summarize this whole thing, and again, th there's, there's going to be a lot coming out. And if you ask me in a few months, I'll probably dredge up another couple of papers that are, that are even further along this path. Um, stimulation of endocannabinoid receptors can have a, a number of effects related to Alzheimer's disease. It has an anti-inflammatory effects that I mentioned. Um, can reduce the pro the processing of a beta peptide, and it's this processing is part of the part of what is stimulated in in the Alzheimer's cascade of events, um, and it increases clearance. So it reduces the, it can potentially reduce the amount of the plaque that forms in Alzheimer's disease. It can improve survival of neuronal cells and culture. Um, reduce oxidative stress damage and prevent memory de deficits in A beta injected mice um, and also in transgenic mouse models. So the conclusion of this is that targeting these receptors is a very sensible thing to do uh, for, uh, based on pharmacology, based on the, the studies that have been done, um, can have beneficial effects in Alzheimer's disease. And it's, it's shown to improve cogni cognition in animal uh, models of Alzheimer's. Uh, of course, this hasn't yet been tested in humans. Probably won't be for a few years. But uh, it's, that fact has been motivated by all of these kinds of studies. <laughs>